Okay, let's begin with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we begin our Lord's Day together, we stop and look your way, raising our eyes, our thoughts to the heavenly realm in order to seek you and to seek your blessing upon us, that we may learn your ways, that we might be imitators of your Son, Jesus Christ, in the world, that we might be thoughtful about what it means to be your people in the world, that we would be discerning and insightful, and that our minds would be changed with an ongoing change so that we wouldn't be conformed to this age, but renewed in our minds, conformed to the age to come. And so we pray you would be with us by your Spirit to that end. Amen. All right, let's see. We are talking about common grace and common curse. How both common grace and common curse share the word common, which means these are experiences in the world that are shared by all. So, I think I've talked a little bit about common grace just by catching up with my notes here. Some people might prefer to call it common blessing because they want to preserve the word grace for the uniquely redemptive context. But with common curse, we are talking about, once again, the experience of this world that Christians and non-Christians share in common. So now we have the two categories, common grace and common curse, and these two categories go a long way to explain the way things are in the world. The way things are with its strange and tantalizing mixture of good and evil, of happiness and sadness, of war and peace, all the different extremes that you can think of. Now as we think about these things, even if I put them into sort of categories as a way to present them, we might not want to think of them too strictly in categories as if rigid lines were drawn in between them. So two things could be going on concurrently in one individual or in one family where they have a foot, as it were, in each column at the same time. But broadly speaking, column A includes wealth, pleasure, beauty, love and happiness, Column B includes poverty, pain, ugliness, hate, and misery. And they coexist together in this world for the duration of the present age. They may, they may occupy the exact same space at the exact same time. But when they're taken together like this, these two categories account for the ongoing preservation of the human race so that the promise that God made in Genesis 3.15, the enmity between the two seeds, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, that the seed of the serpent would bruise the seed of the woman's heel, but the woman's seed would crush the serpent seed's head, Common grace and common curse account for this ongoing preservation of the human race so that promise might be fulfilled. And all the while, humanity, creation itself, 
is harassed and afflicted by innumerable troubles of life in this world, or as Meredith Klein put it, the man who introduced me to this concept many, many, many years ago, common grace was introduced to act as a rein, this kind of rein, like on a horse, to act as a rein to hold in check the curse on mankind and to make possible an interim historical environment. Interim historical environment as the theater for a program of redemption. By reason of the common curse, there would be natural and social evils, destructive earthquakes in various places, and devastating wars of nations rising against nations, so that man's civilization and man himself would be threatened with total extinction. But the restraining hand of God's common grace would temper the common curse until redemptive history had run its full course and the appointed hour of the final parousia had come. The parousia, the, the appearance, the presence of Jesus. So where the forces of common curse create anarchy, the forces of common grace preserve order. If common curse creates wars, common grace confines them and brings them to an end. Now, to make this clear, I'm going to ask a series of questions to highlight um, these conflicting realities and how there is a constant tension in the way that things are. Maybe the Chinese have an idea of this when they talk about the yin and the yang, though I'm not promoting that, I'm just saying there's something intuitive about this. But there are tensions that exist where it's very difficult to determine who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. So this is for you. These are questions to illustrate. Is religion a force for good in the world or is it a force for evil? Yes, says Kara, without any effort to explain herself. No. No, go ahead. Why? Why say yes? It was an either-or question. No, I'm, I'm not sure it really is. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a force of evil because it teaches about false gods and it leads people astray, as it were. But it's a force for good because it, religions tend to promote, it, in a general way, tend to promote peace. So it would be a general good to, to spread the message of peace even if it involves false gods, that would be a common grace thing. Okay, so how many people believe that religion tends to spread peace, historically speaking? What could be more peaceful? What could be more peaceful than the great monotheisms of the world? All right, all right. I'll never explain myself again. No, I'm actually trying to be a, a little bit of an irritant because the question can't be answered. The question that you posed? Even the original question. It was an either or question. It's either or right. So anyone else? Is religion a, a, a force for good in the world? Ever? Anywhere? Don't even think in terms of, you know, final judgments and salvation just in terms of the presence of religious people and organized religion in the world. Is it ever good? Yes. Of course it is. It's often very good and is often actively in service for the good of various communities or even mankind as a whole. Is religion a force for evil in the world? 
Of course it is. It's a terrible force of evil in the world because you have the God who gives you the divine blessing on all of your worldly ambitions so that you can coerce your followers into using, for instance, violence to pursue your own greedy ends. So my answer was right. If you take the question apart, you can answer yes to each part. Exactly. And that's why I'm illustrating that common grace and common curse coexist. See, in one sense, Christianity wants to look for black hats and white hats. And that's an easier way to think about the world, particularly with the limitations of, of the human brain, which force us to sort of minimize reality and, and simplify it in order to interact with it. That's, that's actually a, a, a physiological reality, how the brain works. Yet when we step back, we all know that life is far more complicated than black hats and white hats, and that the ones who wear the white hats often take them off to put on black hats for a while, and vice versa. And so, in these various categories, I'm illustrating with questions to you how we're to think about the world under the reign of Jesus Christ in all of its complexity, in all of the tensions that exist, and we're saying we have a biblical way to think about these things. Okay? Here's a two-part question on law enforcement. Are police departments in America staffed by bigoted officers who target, harass, and even harm members of minority communities? Or are police departments in America staffed by brave men and women who, for relatively little compensation, risk their lives to protect their own communities? Okay, so we have another yes, right? Now, in popular debate, right, in the, in the white hat, black hat debate, where we have to simplify in order to process information, people tend to break. They either break left or they break right. And I don't mean politically left or right, I just mean they go off in one of two directions. So law enforcement becomes uh, innately virtuous and therefore anyone who participates in it is by definition good or law enforcement is innately uh, a tool of the state to enforce unjust laws uh, and allow people to act on their violent impulses under the gun and the badge that they wear. Are doctors only in it for the money? or do they genuinely care about their patients? That question for Doug. Okay, we could all look back. <laughs> Absolutely yes and yes. <laughs> yes and yes, okay. Um, I, I'm guessing that there are times where those things conflict, where an individual might A, opt for the money over the best possible care, or where a doctor may sacrifice himself or herself financially for a patient's welfare. Think about organizations that send uh, medical staffs into the developing world, for instance, where they practice their medicine under duress, great stress, perhaps even under the threat of violence, um, and other people who bilk and bilk, the, say, the Medicaid system, in order to get as much out of it as they can. So do we hate doctors or do we like doctors? We love okay, so that's as far as we can go. <laughs> Are religious leaders 
faithful in their service to the God that they serve and his people, or are they basically religious charlatans who milk their naive congregations for all that they can get? Okay. I've seen it both ways. Both. Okay. Is marriage a good thing or a bad thing? We're both good. <laughs> Husbands, leave the room for a moment. We'll take two separate votes. I mean, there, there are times where, you know, in one single day, I think marriage could be God's greatest gift to humanity or um, his imposition of the cross on me specifically, singled out from all individuals in the world. But when we take it, of course, in the larger picture, we wonder, is marriage a good or is it a bad? And the answer is yes just like all the other answers. And what I'm doing here is I'm trying to just illustrate in ordinary everyday life how common curse and common grace coexist in God's world. Things are not typically as bad as they can be and at the same time things are not as good as we almost intuitively know that they could be so that we're always striving in one direction but finding ourselves defeated and being dragged in the other direction. Okay. Now it's your turn. Give me your contribution to this quiz. I had five questions. Can you add any? I'm, okay, I'll, I'll read through the questions, though you don't have to answer them. Is religion a force for good in the world or is it a force for evil? A two-part question on law enforcement. Are police departments in America staffed by bigoted officers who target, harass, and even harm members of minority communities? Are police departments in America staffed by brave men and women who for relatively little compensation, risk their lives to protect their communities? Are doctors only in it for the money, or do they genuinely care about their patients? Are religious leaders faithful in their service to the God that they serve and his people, or are they religious charlatans who milk their naive congregations for all that they can get? Okay, let's define lawmaker. How are you defining lawmaker? People that desire to become elected and get elected to help the government. Okay, so you're thinking of lawmaker in the context of democratic slash republican societies, little d, little r as opposed to in the ancient world where the king made the law, right? Amen. But he, he himself individually is the lawmaker. Okay, but that's the whole, I mean, that's, that, that's included. Is he in it for himself or is he in it for the Okay. I think we need to recognize also that uh, when we answer both, it doesn't mean that some people are good and some people are bad. There are probably uh, law enforcement officers who are bigoted law enforcement officers who are brave men and women serving their communities for very little pay and who also don't like minority groups and oppression. I mean, it's, it's a single person can answer, can answer that. Right. And that's earlier I said that these two, common grace, common curse, 
coexist together simultaneously occupying the exact same space at the exact same time. And that was my point. Oh, Line go between countries, it goes right, right through Egypt. Exactly. Genesis 20, it's a story of Abimelech and Abraham and Sarah. And in this case, a uh, king, uh, in many ways, was more, a king who was a pagan was more righteous than Abraham. So he did, the king did good, and Abraham did evil. I have said good, he did good. And, uh, and Abraham did evil. Right. Uh, overall, the answer could be probably flipped. <laughs> right. But it's uh, but there he's not common grace and common curse. Right. When he's harem building and wants to add Sarai to his harem, right. uh, ignorantly, right, and actually under false pretenses. Because Abraham lied. Right. Okay, so if at any time during this quiz you either said or thought, well, it depends on who you ask, or you answered yes to a, an either or question, then you're pointing us back to the question that I asked previously, whose reality is reality? Whose reality is reality? Because in, at the horizontal level, we all engage commonly, but we all have separate realities. Who owns reality? God does. Yes, only if you're a spirit-filled Christian. No. Yes. No, 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 I'm not talking about sovereignly you know, in terms of a hypothetical theology. That's what I mean by horizontal. We're interacting with other human beings uh, historically, probably in nation states, communities were largely homogeneous, right? People of the same skin color, people of the same religion, people under the single king. Uh, in the modern Western world, we throw everybody into the arena together and say, get along. So, whether at the larger sort of social political level, whose reality is reality, or in my first illustration, between the, the young, excited couple who can't wait to be married and live life together, versus a similar couple who believed this five years earlier, but have now buried their five-year-old boy uh, who succumbed to leukemia, whose rea which reality is real? The, the exciting world is my oyster, uh, the benefits and possibilities are endless reality, or life is a death march that requires perseverance through the grayness as we try and cope with life's ultimate tragedy. Who's, they're experiencing two realities, right? And as they are subjectively interpreting their worlds, they're looking at two distinct worlds. And the only thing that separates them is an experience. So one experience change changes reality, at least reality as it's subjectively experienced. Let's put it the, as it's felt. And so people operate from their own experience and they make grand universal claims about reality. A woman has a bad experience with men in relationships and she's done with men. Uh, there are three reports within a month uh, of uh, white police officers harassing or harming members of the minority community. Well, that's what cops, that's what cops are. 
our brains can't handle reality, so we have to shrink everything down into manageable categories. So we're actually defining morality, or excuse me, reality, moment by moment, day by day, largely depending on how we feel. So the ultimate answer is, Whose reality is reality? It's God's reality as he reveals himself in his word. But in terms of our experience of reality, God has an explanation. God interprets the world for us with these categories of common grace and common curse. This is what makes political discourse so so uh, nasty in the world because there, there's my reality and there's your reality and only by force of will, maybe even by force of arms, will I impose my reality on your reality. There is nothing good in you, there is everything good in me, and therefore it's a fight to the death. Okay, so this leaves us stuck without a satisfying, credible answer that is universal and comprehensive in scope. That is, whose reality is reality? If it's left up to individuals and the way they interpret their worlds based on, you know, just very little bits and pieces of evidence that have already been filtered uh, before they even arrived in their brains through editorial decisions and internet functions and all the rest, we have no satisfying, credible answer that is universal, that is, it takes in the whole, and comprehensive. It speaks to every part of the whole. And so now I want to come at it from a different angle and add another layer to this whole concept. I hate hospitals. I hate hospitals. I wish they didn't exist. Not only are they filled with, you know, the, the injured and sick people, some of them who are terminal and some of them who are dying rather painful and, and prolonged deaths, but they have a horrific history of barbaric procedures and, and a complete ignorance of hygiene and sanitation which created opportunities for mass infection. I hate hospitals. I love hospitals. I thank God that they exist. They take in the injured and the sick and not only do they care for them, they actually heal them and restore them to their families and friends who would be bereft without them. Am I right or am I wrong? Both are true, right? An ordinary, an ordinary hospital is one way to illustrate this strained coexistence of common grace and common curse. People go to hospitals because of the common curse of illness and injury. Hospitals, therefore, are common grace institutions. They provide a haven for convalescence where patients can receive the attention of dedicated doctors, nurses, technicians, maybe even administrators. Except that there'd be no need for them in the first place if it weren't for common curse. So common curse creates the need for hospitals because in hospitals, tests are run, diagnoses are made, operations are performed, and drugs are administered, all with the goal of providing relief to sufferers, yet often with remarkable success. And yet, as much as a hospital may improve and prolong a patient's life, that patient, the one who 
is being treated will still die one day even if he or she dies in a hospital bed. There are no hospitals in hell because there is no common grace in hell. This is just part of the hellishness of hell. However, in heaven, in the new creation, there are no hospitals there either because there's no need for hospitals. Common grace and common curse run their course through human history, but both will come to an end. Now, while they exist, hospitals are for non-Christians and Christians at the same time. A Christian who has received God's special redemptive grace, his his unmerited favor, this blessing of eternal life, they get sick or get injured and have to go to hospitals, even though they're the children of God. As Adam's fallen children, we do not deserve to receive any benefits at all from a hospital or a police force or a legal system or a well-stocked grocery store, or even heat and air conditioning, right? We are, as the Catechism puts it, liable to all miseries in this life for our sins and for our sin. But God softens the suffering that we deserve by generously alleviating those sufferings through His common grace. Things could always be better, but they could always be worse. Adam has to labor and sweat to get the ground to yield its crop. But it will yield its crop so that he can eat and survive. So going back to the hospital, Christians and non-Christians alike get sick, they get injured, and so they both commonly need the service that a hospital provides, and they both benefit from it. A believer and a non-believer may even share a room in the oncology ward where they both receive identical treatment for the exact same cancer. And maybe in that room, under the, the distress of cancer treatment, maybe the believer has a chance to say something to the unbeliever about saving grace the work of God in Christ to reconcile sinners to himself. So, in this common grace, common curse setting, believer and unbeliever are brought together a week, a month, a few days, and they have a chance to speak to one another about transcendent things. Medical science allows them both to live. Yet just 200 years ago, before there was any serious cancer treatment apart from amputation, the believer and the unbeliever both would have died. It's death, right? The Catechism, to death itself, liable to all miseries in this life, to death itself, that will finally separate the two, assigning them, so to speak, to their respective slots, redemptive grace or judgment curse, with all that those categories imply. Healthcare illustrates these two categories. But there are plenty of others, whatever it is that is shared by all people in common. Anyone want to... I'm stuffing a lot into this. I hope the illustration is speaking for me. Anyone want to ask a question about this? 
Did you define reality? Have, I haven't yet, except in so far as to describe these two coexisting realities. That one way to look at the world is to see it as God sees it. Common grace and common curse. Common grace was established in order to provide the context, the, the stage, the arena for redemptive grace. The world has to have a history. People have to live, be born, grow up in order to populate the kingdom of God so that he fulfills his Genesis 3.15 promise. But we are still under a curse and Christians who who know that God will raise them from the dead, commonly experience the curse alongside their unbelieving brethren. Does that make sense? Mary broke her knee. God probably doesn't love her very much. Is that right? Of course not. Unbelievers break their knees, and believers break their knees. And they may share, you know, an emergency room together, because they both arrived with broken knees. It's only when the categories of redemptive grace and judgment curse are irrevocably fixed that there will no longer be common grace for the wicked, and there will no longer be common curse for the godly. That's why reality is almost impossible for anyone to explain, apart from, I think, these larger categories provided to us by God to think about the world in all of its surprise and all of its, its uh, uh, complexity. Why, um, as Bob said, the one individual may perform good deeds and bad deeds and leave us with no ability to... Uh, there was a, a fellow in the early 19th century, maybe Doug knows his name, he pioneered the surgical technique that allowed uh, um, that allowed doctors to heal fissures, particularly in women, after they've had childbirth, where certain failures in the body leave them uh, unable to control certain bodily functions. And in some parts of the world, Women like that are segregated from society because they can't control, okay, get the idea. So there was a, a man, a man in the South who pioneered the surgery that could create these fissures. So that's the right word, right? Openings between various inner parts of the body, okay? <clears throat> He carried out his experiments on slave women. And he actually made the incisions that created the fissures in order to, you know, sort of pioneer the technique of repair. What a great good that is for the world. If, you've, if you're a woman and you've ever had a fissure, I don't mean anyone right here, but women in the world, billions of them, uh, your quality of life sinks to close to zero if this thing can't be repaired. But if it can be repaired surgically, what a wonderful gift that is to restore you to your family and to society. There are still countries today that segregate 
women with this medical condition. They can't function in regular society. They're separated from their families. And yet the guy who did it, did it on slaves. Do we erect a statue to him? Or do, if there's a statue, do we pull it down? Let's vote. We can't vote. It's a common grace, common curse reality. From the perspective of 21st century America, we mourn slavery, the racism that informed it, and his probably callous disregard for the feelings, both emotional and physical, of the women that he practiced on. And yet at the same time, we can, as it were, thank God that the work was done because how many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of women, have benefited from what is a rather modest surgical procedure? So which side are you on? You don't have to be on a side, ultimately, because you're a Christian. You can say, to me, this makes sense because I already understand the coexisting, even intermingling realities of common grace and common curse. I don't have to take a side. I can mourn the one part, rejoice in the other, and remain uh, eager for the day of the Son of God's appearing. Okay, so both are reality simultaneously and Christians are capable because of good theology to live in this awkward, tense, tension-filled space in between. All right? But when you do that, when you say that, people say you just don't want to take a side and they say, you know, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. Right. Right. It's a hugely difficult climate to live in, though perhaps there are advantages for that climate if Christians participate in it without taking sides. Who can force us onto a team? It's not the Lord himself, so it's only the, the peer pressure of the larger unbelieving community. But I don't need to be on a side. I don't need to be for monarchy and against democracy or for democracy or against monarchy. I have a citizenship. And I'm only here as a resident alien, but during my sojourn, I, and I don't mean me personally, I mean Christian person, might have ways of explaining reality that could prove to be satisfying to people who aren't satisfied with polarization or simplistic thinking or grand generalizations about all men or all women or all policemen or all doctors or all clergy or who, whatever the category might be. Okay? All right. We'll pick up a little bit more on this. Now let's get ready for worship.